good morning, afternoon or evening, everybody, depending where you are coming from. Welcome to Shaking the Tree, Breaking the Bow, Fraser's Golden Bow at 100 Conference. Thanks for joining us. Please stay muted. To ask questions of our speakers, please send the question to me, Caroline Tully, in the chat, and I'll pose the question to the speakers. And now for a more formal welcome by Professor Tim Parkin from the University of Melbourne. And Basil will play a video of that. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Tim Parkin. I'm Professor of Classics at the University of Melbourne. And it is my pleasure and my privilege to welcome you to this exciting conference. I'm sorry I'm not there live with you. Um, at the time you're watching this, it's one o'clock in the morning and I am in New Zealand, um, out of range of the internet. So I'm pre-recording this in the University of Melbourne in the land of the Wurundjeri people um, about a week before the conference begins. But I wish you, on behalf of the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies, all the very best for this conference and my thanks to Stephanie and Caroline for inviting me. When Caroline first mentioned the idea of the conference to me back in December of 2021, I said that the school would be very glad to support it, and I myself was very interested. I've always been fascinated by Fraser. So if I may, I'd like to say a few words just to start the conference off, just from my own personal perspective about Fraser, and also the fact that, of course, Fraser's not here himself to defend or to speak his, his own opinions about things. Not that I am going to represent Fraser by any means, but I think I would like to share a few words from him as well, if I may. So the Golden Bower, the third edition, finally uh, finalised in 1937 in 13 volumes. First edition was in 1890, second edition in 1900, um, but this massive edition, um, completed in 1915, but then supplemented in 1937, has of course had a very significant impact uh, on the 20th and the 21st century in various ways. Not always for good, of course, um, as you're very well aware. Um, what we're particularly remembering here, of course, is the 1922 edition, the abridged edition brought out by Fraser, or in fact brought out by his wife. I think uh, Lily Fraser, Lady Fraser, was most instrumental, not only in promoting and defending Fraser, but also bringing out this condensed 730-page abridged edition, which did become quite a bestseller in its time and very influential indeed. And it's worth, I think, just quoting briefly from the preface, where he says, he's talking about the Institute of the priesthood, whether the explanation which I have offered of the institution is correct or not must be left to the future to determine. I shall always be ready to abandon it if a better can be suggested. Fraser always emphasised, as we'll see, that he shunned controversy but also was aware that his ideas needed more work, needed to be developed. I myself first got to know Fraser when I was about 11 and my oldest brother bought me this book with a wonderful picture, of course, from um, from Turner's The Golden Bower, 1834, um, the scene from Aeneid Book 6. But I've also, since, as a classicist, become very aware of and respectful of Fraser's work in terms of the classics. His amazing uh, six-volume edition in 1898, 14 years' work, um, of Pausanias. He, just, he says at the beginning of the Pausanias that he's aware that he's not an archaeologist. He's very much working in his study. And the same thing is true of his anthropology. He was an armchair anthropologist. It was Malinowski who would bring in fieldwork. Also very important um, and still very useful is Fraser's Lurb edition of Apollodorus, this um, probably 2nd century AD, Pseudo-Apollodorus, collection of mythological stories like Pausanias, like Apollodorus, like Fraser, a fascination throughout all three in human society, in, in human religion and folklore. Early anthropologists, Pausanias and Apollodorus, but probably the best, most important work of Fraser in the classical world, at least, is his edition of Ovid's Fasti in five volumes, uh, still very important, not least through the Lerb translations he also did of Ovid's Fasti, still very much in use, having had a second edition. So Fraser is still very present um, and very important, I think, in the classical world. 
The Golden Bower, of course, was very has been very influential. In the same year as the abridged edition came out, one of my favourite poems, The Wasteland, was published by T.S. Eliot, who, of course, in his notes, acknowledges two particular works, Jesse L. Weston's book, From Ritual to Romance, and, as he says in the second half of this note, another work of anthropology I am indebted to in general, one which has influenced our generation profoundly, I mean the Golden Bough. Anyone who is acquainted with these works will immediately recognise in this poem, The Wasteland, certain references to vegetation ceremonies. The influence goes on. Apocalypse Now, the great film by Coppola in 1979, um, Kurtz, the character played by Brando, um, has in his library the two works that Eliot mentions, From Ritual to Romance and The Golden Bough. There it is on his desk, the 1922 abridgment. And as well, fans of Jim Morrison will know that he too was very influenced by The Golden Bough. If you look through the contents page to the 13-volume Golden Bough, the third edition, you'll see many of Jim Morrison's lyrics actually reflected in that uh, contents page. What I wanted to do just to finish with these few minutes I've got is just to, in the words of Fraser himself, if he was here with us, what would he think of this conference? Well, when his Pausanias came out, he wrote to the publisher Macmillan, aware that the Germans had done so much work in Pausanias. He said, it is pleasant that all the Germans hitherto have been so civil about the book, Pausanias. I certainly wish to keep on good terms with them. Controversy, he says, is odious to me, besides being a great waste of time. It's a common theme that comes through in his letters. He does not want to generate controversy. Perhaps that's naive of him, but he certainly... Uh, I think would welcome the chance to defend his ideas or at least to hear what's wrong with his ideas so he can modify them. E. Sidney Hartland, a um, professional lawyer, an amateur folklorist, very influential folklorist as well, had much correspondence with Fraser. Um, and he wrote, Fraser wrote to Hartland in one letter, at the end of the letter he wrote when he was trying to defend his ideas, after the second edition came out in 1900. I'm afraid that what I've said will as little alter your opinion as your criticisms have convinced me of the error of my ways. In fact, I have probably wasted both your time and my own by writing this long letter. That is the usual result of controversy. It is not that I have no reply to make to criticism, but that I do not think it worthwhile making it. My plan is simply to state my conclusions together with the facts on which they are based and to leave the matter there. Where writers of authority have adopted different views and it might seem discourteous to pass them over in silence, I note them as briefly as possible, sometimes adding and sometimes not my reasons for dissent. But I have a strong and I think growing dislike of controversy, quite apart from my opinion of its futility, and I try to reduce it to a minimum in my writings. Forgive me for being so tedious, yours sincerely. He carried on a few days later on reflection on that long letter. How dangerous it is, he says, speaking for myself, to trust to one's memory and to write without one's authorities open before one. My letter to you was written without having my book, The Golden Bough, beside me. I've received another lesson to shun controversy, even in a friendly letter, as I would the devil if I believed in him. A nice, nice touch of humour there. Hartland wrote back saying, certainly I'm not trying to be controversial. I simply want to discuss with you ideas on which we disagree. And Fraser replied a few days later, um, grateful, I think, for the friendly tone. Um, I am glad you do not regard our correspondence as controversy, neither do I. We are both anxious, I know, to get clearer ideas and a better grip of the facts, which is what we're still doing. I think Fraser's influence, good and bad, mainly bad perhaps, um, is still one where we, because of it, it makes us think through new ideas. Excuse me. To Merritt, the professor of anthropology at Oxford, in 1904, he, it's worth quoting because Merritt had said, I'm going to be criticizing um, Golden Bower in the next edition of Folklore. Fraser wrote, my dear sir, I'm much obliged to you for your kind and candid letter. The new number of Folklore has not yet reached me. When it comes, I will read your article attentively and shall hope to profit by your criticisms. As you know, I am of opinion that we are just at the beginning of anthropology and that all our views will have to be revised and corrected or wholly set aside when more facts are known and we understand them better. Again, very much worth reflecting on this in 2023, it seems to me. My own theories I regard as more or less tentative, and I hope I shall always be ready to modify or drop them according to the evidence. 
If you help me to do so, it could be talking to us, I shall be grateful to you, and the kind words of your letter will, I feel sure, soften away any little asperities which may have escaped you, as they are very apt to do to anyone in the heat of writing. I'm very glad that you do me the justice, for I think it is justice, to believe that I welcome all honest and well-informed criticism. I sometimes fear that people may think me deaf to reason and wedded to my own opinions because I avoid controversy and seldom or never reply to criticism, unless it is to acknowledge a gross and palpable blunder which I have committed. But I really do try to profit by all sound criticism. I think that's quite useful. Certainly, Malinowski uh, expressed his respect to Fraser, Malinowski, the great pioneer of anthropology, which I think think this from this letter you can read yourself, Fraser found very encouraging. I say encouraging because though I have tried to follow a strictly inductive method, having no belief in theories evolved a priori, I cannot help often fearing that I have allowed my imagination to outrun the evidence. Very telling confession, it seems to me. So I wish you well in this conference going forward, thinking about Fraser's ideas and where they're useful and where they're not. Um, to me, Fraser does deserve respect, however flawed his ideas, as a scholar and as a very hard and passionate uh, worker in the field. He spent most of his academic life at Trinity College, Cambridge, and they've set up this plaque to honour him in memory of him. Um, and I thought it was a fitting way to finish. Just a few final comments, just to quote in translation. So James George Fraser, amassed with untiring scholarship, details of the customs, rites, and religions of every primitive and uncultured society in the world. Unfortunate terminology, of course, but the terminology of the time, however misguided. From this thorny and impassable forest, he plucked his golden bough, and with it opened an avenue into the secrets of the human mind. And on that note, I wish you well in opening up further avenues into the human mind and into the ideas of Fraser. Have a wonderful conference and all the very best wishes from the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies at the University of Melbourne and from me. Thanks to Tim Park and in New Zealand.